Okay, so we are, we're live now. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm Thomas Whitfield. And I'm Justin Perez. And this is Lunchbox Lessons, a podcast where a gay guy forces his early 90s TV show obsession down the throat of his straight friend. Playing the version of the throat will be Justin Perez. <laughs> <laughs> Got a confession and I want to share it with you I've learned a lot of lessons I think maybe you'll learn some too It's more like an obsession And I'm gonna force it on you Guys, welcome to episode one of Lunchbox Lessons. We're going episode by episode through a TV series that I love with all of my heart and my co-host Justin has never seen, at least not yet, or you've seen one episode. I've seen combined over the six or so seasons, I've seen maybe combined one episode altogether. See, the fact that you just said six or so seasons <laughs> uh, says a lot about this because yeah. there are... 10, technically. Oh uh, but if you have never seen this show, I'm not even going to tell you what it is yet because you do not have to have seen this show to listen to this podcast. What this is really about is obsession and why are we obsessed with the things that we are. And Justin is going to help me uncover why I'm obsessed with the things that I am and also how do, how do these things sort of play out in our life. So Justin and I have very different sort of backgrounds. Yes. Um, so, Justin, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a 36-year-old uh, Pisces man from uh, the state of New York. <laughs> I grew up in the Bronx until I was about 11, and then we moved upstate to a little hamlet called Brewster, New York. And uh, I ended up going to school in Chicago, and then eventually in Long Island, and which I now work as a, uh, for the last 13 years, as a New York State court officer. And for about uh, 10 years or so, I dabbled in the old stand-up comedy. And uh, that is my life. Thomas, can you tell us a little something about your life? I always forget about the court officer part, and oh. I always think that's so interesting, and I always forget about it. I was thinking about it on the way here. I was like, wait, what is his day job? Um, so I am actually finishing up my PhD in psychology um, to eventually be a clinical psychologist. So hopefully, you know, if June gets here fast enough, that will be going on. Um, so I've spent the last 10 years of my life in school. It's been a lot, uh, but I'm originally from Michigan. I'm a tourist, which now I feel like I have to put out there. <laughs> um, but more importantly, Justin, I asked you to do this podcast because I, I think that we have very different backgrounds. Yes. So I think that when we, when we put it into the context of this show that we're going to be talking about, it's our backgrounds that might help us to have different perceptions of it. Yes. So myself being white, cisgender, gay male. Yeah. And how would you kind of identify yourself? I would identify myself as 100% uh, Puerto Rican on college forms and uh, <laughs> an Eskimo, 1%. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm Puerto Rican, uh, straight male. Uh, I grew up in, uh, you know, lower income places. And then eventually my parents did all right for themselves. And they're in like lower middle class. And that was sort of my uh, background. That's the way I would get in there. Okay. So, no, and I and that's what I think is interesting is that we're I think we're gonna have very different sort of points of views and takes on things. Um, and I asked you if you wanted to watch all two hundred and twenty episodes <laughs> of Roseanne. Yeah. With me and you, I've seen the show all the way through the entire series multiple times, and you've seen one episode. Mm -hmm. Why the fuck did you say yes? Like that's a that's a big commitment. Well, Tom, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I enjoy our friendship, our, uh, <laughs> our, our budding friendship. Uh, I am always down to see a show. I specifically am a completist of a uh, series. And so if I like this show and lots of people I respect and like like the show, then, I mean, I can't be wrong. You know what I mean? I, like, I, I think my instincts to, to follow it through are uh, interesting. And if it's terrible, even better. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm secretly sort of hoping that you're going to hate it and then be forced to watch 220 episodes of something <laughs> that you cannot stand. Like, this is my personal hell. Or, like, it just turns into that. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Oh, great. Um, I mean, not really. Like, I wouldn't, you know, I just think it'd be funnier. But I do have a tendency to push my obsessions on people. Yeah. Like, I'm always trying to expose people to the TV shows that I like, to the movies that I like, um, to the music that I like. The music's pretty bad. Cause, I mean, I love... <laughs> 
love I love my music. But Billy like, Corgan. Yeah, so love the Smashing Pumpkins. Um, but I will like I'll invite people over and then kind of just like put on what I want to put on yes. or play the music that yes. I and hope that people grasp to it. And then if people do like it, that gets me really excited. Yes. But even when they don't, like with my boyfriend, I'm always kind of trying to like push my stuff on him a little bit and he's like, stop it. What is something you're pushing on him? Like what's the last thing you kind of pushed on him? Uh, so it used to be horror movies, but now it's at a point where I just know he's not going to ever yeah. watch a horror movie mm -hmm. with me. Uh, music. Music. Definitely continues to kind of be music. I put on music the other night and he goes, no, put on normal music. Like the normal <laughs> people want to listen to. What did you put on that he was like, please stop this? Uh, do you know who Kate Flay is? No idea. I, and I could be saying her name incorrectly, um, but I recently was kind of exposed to her music and started listening to it. And it's, it just isn't music that you would hear on the radio right now that I'm aware of. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I, she has like over 100,000 followers on Instagram, so people do know who she is. Yes, yeah, she's a, she exists in this world. Yeah, yeah, but he doesn't <laughs> uh -huh. know who she is, so. Interesting. I, uh, I kind of get like that sometimes. I, uh, I, when I'm dating somebody, I tend to uh, really, like, if I fall in love with a movie specifically, I will just, uh, like, for example, uh, like, one of my favorite movies in the last few years was the movie The Phantom Thread by Paul Thomas Anderson and starring Daniel Day-Lewis. Okay. I know what you're talking about, but I don't I'll, remember anything about I'll it. I'll force it on you. Don't worry. Oh, uh, perfect. No, you know, I think I'm good. <laughs> but when, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, you can watch 226 episodes with me, but uh, I, I will not watch a two-hour movie with you. <laughs> and I sometimes have that mentality. Yes, yes. Well, I, I went, ended up going to the movies four times to watch wow. it with people, and uh, I would have went five times if I would have been able to watch it with somebody and see, like, oh, that was actually very good. And I go, yes, I know because I'm a good curator of quality stuff. That's what I think in my head, but we're all garbage people, you know? There's only one movie that I think I've gone to see multiple times in the theater, and I can't even think of that. Oh, The Jacket with Adrian Brody and then Kira Knightley. <laughs> Did you see that? No. It was such a good fucking movie. It was such that a good movie. That came out in a very specific time in my life. This came out the early 2000s, maybe. And I had a... So the, this is so hard to explain to people under the age of uh, 30, but uh, there was a time where if you wanted to see nudity, easiest way was to go to Blockbuster and look for rated R things. And I believe there was nudity in that movie. And I believe I may have watched that in Fast Forward trying to get to the nudity. <laughs> this is the things we had to do. You had to know a guy, he would dig a hole in a field and pull out his like dad's porn collection. Yeah. And that's the things we did. And I remember the, the specifically the jacket. I, I believe there was a Kira Knightley nudity scene. I mean, she has taken her clothes off in a lot of movies. Mm. You know, being being the gay guy, I'm like, I don't know if she was naked in that or not. <laughs> I have no idea. I saw it four times. <laughs> I have no idea. It's not a memorable experience for you. <laughs> I guess not. Um, so, so that's a little bit about who we are, why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are going to take a quick break with this episode, which we're not going to be doing with the further with the future ones, um, because we are actually going to watch the pilot, and I want to get your initial reaction, Justin. But yes. I'm curious, before we do that, like, I mean, this is a show, Roseanne has been around for a long time, it premiered mm -hmm. in 1988, like, it, at least you've heard of it, if not seen any of it, and what are you expecting? Um, I am expecting a lot of, uh, ah, oh, Dan! A lot of those. Um, I'm expecting a lot of sass from the children, right? I believe that there's a couple of kids. There's a uh, Becky. I know there's controversy with original Becky or something like that. Am I hitting on something? Yeah, yeah. I only know that because a guy, uh, George Gordon, has a, a, a bit about it. A, a friend comedian has a bit about meeting original Becky. Uh, <laughs> so I'm expecting that. I'm expecting a change of Becky eventually. And I'm expecting uh, a lot of poverty. Does it? <laughs> I, for some reason, I remember like people going like, "Wow, it was really something." They showed poor people, so I, I'm curious to see what their actual portrayal is, and if it's accurate or if it's like you know ABC's portrayal of poor people. So I'm, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. What do you? What are you hope? Like, what are your hopes and dreams for me before I watch this? I think, I mean, I think my hopes and dreams are that you are going to instantly love it <laughs> and be hooked and want to know everything about it and uh -huh. not be able to wait to watch the next episode. Wow. But I mean, it is like, 
I don't think that's going to happen initially because it's it's a pilot. Yeah. Like, pilots are set up in a way to where you are meeting all the characters, getting an idea of sort of what's going on. Yes. Like pilots, I, when it comes to a sitcom, a pilot is generally not going to just hook you. If it's a drama series, you know, then they're going to have some sort of a hook. And it, I mean, it's also how long ago? Thirty years ago. Yes. I. Uh... Pilots have to give out so much information. They have to set up everything. They have to show everyone has value. And they don't actually know the cast at that point. Like, yeah. Like if you watch The Office or Parks and Rec, the first seasons of both of those shows are terrible because they don't actually know the strengths of the cat uh, of the cast. And then um, the only good pilot that exists, in my mind, <laughs> is uh, <laughs> Cheers is a good one. And weirdly enough, Frasier is an incredible pilot. Where it gets out everything. Like, did you ever see the... I don't think I've seen the pilot for either of those. Well, they're both good, but the one for Frasier is incredibly well. It gets a lot of information, and it actually has, like, a very touching story in it. And then it gives you so much information of, like, Frasier's dad moving in with him. Uh, Frasier uh, moving to Seattle. Why he moved to Seattle. Uh, it, why What he does with his job. It sort of gets, like, four or five things down, and you're, like, also amused the entire time. While introducing, like, four different... Uh, actors, you know what I mean? So, I am looking forward to it. It may not be that, because it's once again it's very difficult to pull off a pilot. But uh, yeah, should be fun. Should be fun, Thomas. <laughs> You're imposing on me. Should be fun. Okay, so we're gonna take a quick break, which will be you know 30 minutes for us and 10 seconds for you, <laughs> and we'll be back. Yeah, we're gonna have 10 seconds of silence, and then you're gonna hear the, our, our responses to it. Okay, so we are back. So we just watched the pilot. Initial reaction, Justin. I've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, no, it was good. I, I thought it was pretty good. I, uh, I'm, I'm very curious about the context of when that show came out, how it played. Where was everyone like, oh my God, what is this revelation? Um, and uh, I thought it was good. I thought it was a pretty solid pilot. Um, Roseanne was a much better actor than I would have thought for being a stand-up comic uh, in her first real thing on TV. Besides, you know, I'm sure she had a, an appearance on TV somewhere. I think she did the, the Tonight Show. That was her thing. Yeah, she had done a lot of um, like late-night TV late night from what I understand. I'm not sure if she had a, a comedy special at the time. Any like big Roseanne fans that are listening to this are probably like, what the screaming, fuck? I know, screaming totally. at the... I don't know that much about her stand-up career. Yeah, to be I, honest. I could fill in for that later. I, I used to know a lot about her stand-up career, but uh, she strikes me as someone who, once she got famous, she sort of cut back a little bit on stand-up, which is perfectly fine. I actually saw her for the first time um, at Just for Laughs. I want to say... Montreal? Uh, I think it was Toronto. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like three years ago. Um, and it was fun. Uh, but I do think that at this time, there were not families like that on TV. And even now, there really aren't a lot of families like that on TV. There are more, though. Um, and one thing that you had brought up was, like, what is, like, poverty? Yeah. What, I mean, what did, what did you think about that? <laughs> um, they were definitely lower middle class. They weren't, like, poor. They were poor, like, eh, I'm living check to check. But not poor, like, I'm on government assistance. I'm, you know, I'm getting... I'm I'm a can person. I'm picking up cans in the street. They they both are. Uh, Roseanne's definitely employed. She seems to work at a plastic company that's only uh, employed by women apparently. <laughs> and George Clooney has a boss, which was exciting to see. Still looks good. He still looked pretty good even before the gray hair. I think it, this may have been his first uh, TV show. I could be wrong about that, but it was it was very early on. It was like, early in his no career. One. I I I remember he was definitely in. Um, a show with Trudy. Um, Facts of Life. Facts of Life. He was in Facts of Life at one point. I do I do know that. Okay. I think that was before this. I think so too. Um, but he, he's just a couple of that guys, you know, a couple appearances here and there. And then his first real thing was ER in like 96 or so. 94? 94. I have no idea. We have no idea. I did look up some actual shows that came out around this time. In 1987, we had uh, Married with Children, which is actually pretty close in tone to the show. You know that's that's interesting because I never liked Married with Children. <laughs> really? I don't know why there was. I just didn't like it. Oh, it was um, it was interesting. I do remember some jokes, and it, it was uh, 
Maybe next season we'll do that. We'll do <laughs> all ten seasons of Married with Children. <laughs> Just make you suffer. Uh, uh, different World, Full House, Cheers was still running, The Cosby Show was still running, Family Ties, ALF, Silver Spoons, Punky Brewster, Webster, Golden Girls. Yeah. These are a lot of those are pretty solid shows. Yes. Like I loved Alf, uh, you know, Full House, Golden Girls. I never really got into the Cosby show. Cosby Show's good. Uh, Cosby Show was wholesome fun, but also had some pretty smart things into it. Um, doesn't hold up as well right now, I'll say, for some reason. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think this is something I found out. So this show also had the same producers as the Cosby Show. It was Casey Werner, Carsey okay. Werner. It was the same producer of Roseanne and also the same producer of the Cosby Show. So they were just killing it in terms of syndication and stuff. And I feel like I've seen Matt Williams' name on everything. Really? And he is the producer of this. I don't know. Maybe I've just seen Roseanne so many times that I, <laughs> that I think <laughs> his name is on everything. But it's really just this. Yeah, they produced Cosby Show, A Different World, Roseanne, a bunch of crap, uh, Grace Under Fire, Sybil, Cosby, Third Rock from the Sun, that 70s show. Uh, and a bunch of crap after that. But they had some uh, four or five hits that went to syndication. And when we, so with Roseanne, I think in, in later episodes, they actually talk more about their income. And I believe it's in like the early 20,000. Yeah, that's right. right. And it was definitely like paycheck to paycheck. They didn't mm -hmm. have dirt floors. No, they did not uh, have dirt floors, but they're buying things in bulk. Have we, have we seen this episode? Oh my, uh, like a four gallon thing of corn. <laughs> of corn, which Dan actually referenced, the, the, the cream of corn. Mm -hmm. uh, his idea was to... Uh, to make a, a cream of corn for the kids. Uh, and corn is said in every episode of this season. What? Really? Yeah, they say, I read that online. I've actually never listened to it or listened for it. Um, but apparently they say, they find a way to say corn oh. in every episode. I don't I don't know why. It's kind of horrifying. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, I, I hope there's no references to shit. That's my, uh, <laughs> that's my hope. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, kind of. Well, you will see. Oh, like, would you like? How would they have compared to your family in terms of like socioeconomic status? Um, my family growing up, especially when I was a kid, when we were in the Bronx, um, we lived, we rented from a family that uh, it was a like a two story house. The people who owned it lived below us. We lived above them. It was, I think, a two bedroom. Um, it was like a, a nice neighborhood. It wasn't particularly terrible, but, uh... And how many of you were there? I, I'm an only child. You're an only child? Only okay. Me, myself. Okay. Yeah. I had a lot of weird time to do stuff. I'm very easily occupied by myself. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I think, um, it's not as chaotic. I, I think having three kids is pretty, is, ins ensures chaos and they really do a good job of doing that because even when they're having like very serious moments kids are bursting in with crap at all times how does this compare for you how does this uh so i actually remember when i was growing up so i didn't watch this when it was first on because i would have been four years old when it came out. <laughs> so i didn't really connect with it yeah. then uh and i but i started watching it in like the early thousands yeah um but i remember like when i was a kid i wasn't allowed to watch it because yeah. my mom said they were mean to each other. <laughs> Meanwhile, like my family was terrible to each other. Yeah. So I was like, mm. uh, but I was the youngest and then I had two older sisters okay. and my parents were still married. So like that setup was e exactly like two that. Two older sisters, a, a, yeah. a little runt at the bottom. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And uh, my dad was a teacher in Michigan. Mm -hmm. So I think that he was making like high 20s. Yeah. I, I mean, I think when he re retired, he wasn't even making 40. Oh, man. Uh, so, and in Michigan, you can live, like, pretty decently on that. But I think that it, I mean, my parents never really talked about money that I heard very much until after they got a divorce. And then that was a, a big thing that came up all the time. But I get the impression How did it come of it. Just, like, my mom wanting more money yeah. from my dad and, like, when are we, you know. And your dad's like, this woman's trying to take my money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> A little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it was a con it was a very contentious divorce. We don't have to get into it now. We got two hundred twenty <laughs> episodes. Uh, but I think that it like it kind it compares my family a lot. I don't know if they were living paycheck to paycheck, mm -hmm. but it definitely a lot of buying things in bulk, like stretching the dollar. Yeah. 
um, my mom would have like the the nights where she would sit to pay bills with like a checkbook on yes. the table and yes. like balancing a checkbook. And I saw a lot of that kind of stuff going on and my family argued a lot. Yeah. So I think a lot of it rings really true to to how I grew up. Yeah. I, I, a small town in Michigan where, you know, I don't, I don't think I ever barked in class, but my parents definitely had to go and uh, talk to my teachers, which is something that happens in the pilot is yeah. Roseanne has to go to school because her daughter Darlene is barking, who she's probably oh, yeah, like third or fourth grade. Yeah, let's go over the, the synopsis of the, uh, of the episode. So the, the episode opens up with a joke. Um, it uh, quickly, uh, do you remember the joke? Well, which one? It, it, the kid was asking Roseanne for something. Okay, so DJ comes in, which is the youngest. How did you feel about DJ as a character? I didn't really get a good impression of uh, DJ. Well, you know what? That's fine, because he's not in episode two. He disappears? They uh, they recast him. <laughs> so this kid is Sal Baron Born. It's B-A-R-O-N-E. Not yeah. sure how you say his last name. Yeah. But apparently they filmed the pilot. And then uh, between when it was picked up and when they filmed it, he grew too much. But also he and Darlene apparently fought on, on set all the time. So Sarah and Darlene's the star, the star and she has like a lot of lines and she yeah. was very memorable. So uh, rumor is they were fighting all the time yeah. and the, uh, his mother was concerned and then either she pulled him out or they took him out or something happened. Yeah. But how pissed would you be? If you were that kid, like the show ends up being a huge hit at its peak. It had over 20 million viewers. He would have been set for life. Yeah. He didn't have to do anything else in his life. And he would have been set for life because um, for people who don't follow TV stuff, uh, hitting syndication means you have over 100 episodes and then they're allowed to start selling it to networks uh, and reruns. And that's how you get your money beyond your original contract. So like, let's say Roseanne was getting $200,000 an episode at one point. Um, if it goes to syndication, in addition to her yearly salary from ABC, she will keep on getting money f f in forever. Like right now, if you go to Amazon.com, the entire series is on there. That's what we watched it on. And uh, r right now, Roseanne is getting paid a percentage of that. Yeah, As absolutely. is the rest of the cast, as would this little child. Who's <laughs> For now, that one episode. Yeah, who's now like 45 and, you know, Lord knows what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I actually looked at his IMDb and there's nothing there. <laughs> Like, I Googled him, like, where is he now? Like, nothing comes up. But, uh... Maybe he's a successful dentist who's, like, got his shit together, which would be probably better than being in show <laughs> yeah, So Michael Fishman that you're going to meet in episode two, who then is DJ, uh -huh. like, very much now has a normal Good. life, like a Good. normal job, normal life, and is now back on the Connors. Oh, yeah. Um, but... So, yeah, so you're, you know, he just kind of comes in, he's like a little bit lame, has an issue with his shoe, she's like, get loafers. Get and, loafers, yeah, yeah, he yeah. goes, mom, I have a knot in my shoe, and handing her the uh, shoe, and he goes, and she goes, get loafers. Uh, so it, it starts to establish she's sassy, she's, uh, she's no nonsense mom, you know what I mean, uh, shows Dan, uh, let's go through the plot here. Right? Yeah, so, so then Dan comes in. Um, asks if there's coffee and yeah. she's like isn't there always coffee why do you have to ask me if there's coffee we've yeah, been married yeah. for X amount of years and there's always they start giving coffee. exposition they start giving uh, how long they've been married uh, what's going on with their lives uh, Dan's sort of in between jobs he's sort of a repairman of some type yeah and uh, he's looking for jobs they're trying to divvy up the work uh, Roseanne has to go and see not Becky but Darlene's teacher teacher because she has a, an issue. A behavioral problem. A behavioral problem. Uh, then I believe it cuts to Roseanne's job. Yep, at Wellman, uh, Wellman Plastics. Wellman Plastics, which is a very busy scene. A lot of things going on. Did uh, you ever know anybody that worked in a factory? That's a great question. Um, I'm sure I did. I know my mom has had various jobs. She used to work in the postal service, I remember at that point, which was interesting. She got written up one time for using the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, you, you have to keep sorting the letters. It'll never stop. Uh, so uh, it's pretty much a factory when you're like a, a, a letter a letter handler in the uh, post office. Uh, did you? My stepfather worked in a car factory. Oh wow! For years, but I in Michigan, I mean, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't really. I mean, my mom got remarried way after I was out of the house. Yeah. So yeah. I don't. I haven't really known him since he's worked in a factory. Yeah but for a very long time. But yeah, I mean, you just see them standing at this table, like 
doing stuff with plastic. And as the series goes on, you see a little bit more, but yeah. they're just standing there doing shit with plastic. Yeah, yeah. And so we uh, we get introduced to uh, Roseanne's sister. Jackie. Jackie is played by Laurie Metcalf, who is a classic Chicago actor. Uh, I, think, I believe she was in Steppenwolf. She was in yeah. a whole bunch of things in Chicago. She's a legendary Chicago and Broadway actress now. She's done a lot of things on Broadway. Um, she's introduced, uh, and she also works at the factory. She's talking about her life and about how she's been going to self-help classes, which is a big thing in the 80s. Oh, my God. And it is... So, Jackie is by far my favorite character. Yeah. Like, I... I think I probably am Jackie to a certain degree. <laughs> I am a, a 37 year old woman in 1980. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Perfect. And uh, she is like, so her opening thing was I went to the self help help thing, uh, see it, become it mm -hmm. type thing. It's basically the secret for 1980. It's exactly the it's secret. The same thing. If you can visualize it, you can do it. Yeah. And, and then the secret was rehashed in like 97 or something like that and totally. then sold on Oprah Book Club. And she is very much this character that you'll see throughout the series is always kind of like looking for something. Like who she is in this pilot, like you see a lot of the characters evolve, obviously, yeah. but like her center is this person that is always searching for something and thinks that the next thing is the answer. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a very uh, sad character thing that I know all too well. <laughs> yeah, and I, like I've, I, like, I think of all of them on the show, that is probably the one that, as an adult, I relate with the most. As a kid, I, it was, like, Darlene, a yeah. thousand percent. Like, yeah. just, I was kind of an asshole. Yeah. Always had, like, a smart-ass comeback. Yeah. I, I think my favorite characters in shows are people who try to change but just fail continuously to get there. Like, Mad Men has a lot of that. Like, Don Draper tries to change a lot. Pete Campbell actually does make a significant change towards the end. But uh, a lot of it's just re repeating cycles over and over and over because that's the way people are. People mostly don't change. People mostly make the same mistakes and then make incremental changes and learn to sort of get by with themselves. And that's yeah. as deep as we're going to get in, in our lives. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just going to give you my PhD now because that's pretty much what I learned over <laughs> my seven years no of one, studying. <laughs> no one changes, make incremental changes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we keep on going through the plot. Um, she, we're at the factory. We get out of the factory. I believe we go to the school next. Yep. We go to the school. A uh, curly-haired woman is the uh, teacher. A younger woman than Roseanne. Um, something I will comment on is that um, I, I'd be really hard pressed to remember a time where like the two leads were two heavies. Like the two heavies were heavies, actually. You know what I mean? Oh, you mean with Roseanne and Dan? Both yeah, they're both like them. yeah, like uh, like overweight people. Yeah. And it's never commented on. It's never sort of, uh, there's not like a thing of like, listen, uh, I, I gained weight because my mom died or something. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's, it's just what it it's is. It's just who they are. Yeah. And it, there's a couple scenes of them eating Doritos and stuff, making mac and cheese. It's just, it is like a comfortable sort of thing that they are. And I like that. That's really nice. Um, so brave, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's some of that on TV now mm -hmm. but i think at the time it was definitely yeah there's, there's plenty of that now but I, I imagine i imagine roseanne was such a good comic and charismatic that they were like yes and then maybe somebody like and, and then I, I imagine there was maybe a fight to get john goodman you know what i mean maybe yeah i'm not sure or maybe fat guys are okay maybe fat guys are okay maybe fat women were we were, it was kind of a taboo back then. Well, I think like big guys have always kind of been okay. Yes. Like they've Carl always Winslow. been on TV and yeah, like yeah. that's just always kind of been there. Yeah, yeah, that's true. There, there has been a lot of fat guys in TV. On the DVDs, you can actually see their audition tape together. Oh, interesting. And the two of them are like clearly okay. just kind of like instantaneously connect. They have chemistry. Yeah. That's good. That's always good when you cast actual chemistry and actual talent as opposed to like this guy's hot. Get him in there. <laughs> He's gonna be a star, baby. Don't you want to ride the train of George Clooney? <laughs> yeah, uh, so, uh, so we go to the school. The teacher is telling everyone, is telling Roseanne that uh, that Darla is having an issue. Darla, Darlene, Darlene, Darla is from the Little Rascals. That's uh, show more my speed. 
<laughs> uh, a lot of diversity for the time period, actually, but uh, a lot of characters that we didn't care for back then. And Little Rascals. And little Rascals, yeah. <laughs> I've never seen it. Uh, it's owned by Cosby, weirdly enough, and he will not release it. Hmm. He owns the rights to Little Rascals. Another thing to dislike, Bill Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, the teacher is explaining that, she, that Darlene is barking in class. A couple of sasses back and forth. And uh, and uh, that's where we sort of leave that, right? Yeah, pretty much. She's like, I don't, I don't see what the problem is. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I guess she does it a couple times. Tell, tells her to stop. She stops, and then Roseanne's like, so what's the problem? Yeah, she stopped barking. Yeah. So who cares? Yeah. This is not a, a thing. Yeah. And it's it's basically a, a young person with a uh, enlightened way of thinking about children. Of if they act up in class, maybe there's a problem at home. And then Roseanne, she's going, hey, she's a kid. I don't know what to tell you. Which is definitely a commentary on, on socioeconomic status and class. Because they're like, if they, you know, she has so many other things going on in her life that her daughter barking in school is like, who the fuck cares? Yeah. yeah. Whereas, like, if she wasn't working a job, taking care of the whole family, yes. you know, like taking care of everybody, she'd probably be like, oh, this is an actual concern. And I think that probably speaks to the majority of people that, like, eh, the kid's probably fine. Yeah. I probably didn't need to take an hour off work to come and do this and not get paid for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we leave that. We go back to the house. Dan is just hanging out, he's uh, asking for beer. He hasn't repaired the uh, sink that was messed up earlier. Uh, Roseanne gives him gruff. A, a little bit of an argument ensues. Uh, Roseanne threatens to actually fix the sink. She starts to fix the sink. And then uh, Darlene starts to have a, uh, she cuts herself with a scissor, right? Yeah, what did you, um... What did you think about their argument? Because I don't know how common that was to see on TV, or even now, like there's a certain gruffness in their like arguing yeah. that you don't see in a sitcom. You see it in a drama. Yes. But you don't really you see, see it in a marriage story. Or you see it Oh in... my god, fucking <laughs> marriage story. I can't <laughs> destroy me. Yeah. It uh but like you don't see it in a sitcom. Yeah. Like you agree there's some sort of a like rawness or like realness to it that that's almost uncomfortable. Um a actual argument is mean and they were kind of mean to each other. And they said some cutting things to each other. And then it was easily dissipated by the arrival of like a child bursting in with something. Yeah, like something real yeah. happening. And it's like, this is nothing. I, yeah. It's just us getting our frustration out on each other. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I like that. I, I don't, I'm trying, I'm, like all the shows I mentioned before, I'm trying to think of an actual argument. I remember the Cosby show, there would be disagreements. But they were never arguments of like, you don't know me, you know, like, screw you, you fat bastard, you know, whatever the hell they would say. Yeah. Like, they would never say that. It just was an art, it was a disagreement, and let's work it out. And then at, at the end of the episode, it would be worked out. There would be nothing lingering. Uh, so I think that was good. I thought that was really good. Um, I took some notes. Um, finishing with the plot, we get to uh, the resolution. The finger is fixed. Mm -hmm. The, Although she has like a gallon of blood on the towel that she's, she's holding. She's holding a towel, the child's holding a towel, and it, it truly is a, a gallon of blood, and it seems very easily fixed by just holding your head up, and then they put a band-aid on or something. Yeah, yep. Um, yeah, I, and that's pretty much the episode. The episode ends with them um, hanging out with Dan's boat that he's making. Maybe he'll never make that boat, is my guess. <laughs> don't spoil anything. I but, feel like I don't want to tell you. <laughs> but maybe it's never... It's going to be a disappointment if the show is what I think it is. It it'll there'll be small victories, but never a humongous victory. And I imagine that boat's either never going to do or something terrible is going to happen to it. That's my guess. I know nothing about the show. That is my guess. <laughs> uh, and that's pretty much the episode. They start. They make a joke about making love, and that's how the episode ends. Which uh, I also don't know how common that was at that time either for a couple to like make a joke about. Maybe she says like, "Let's do it." Yes. Yes. That's, I'm sure that term was written over five different ways to say, let's have sex. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. That's, that's better than like, you know, let's fool around. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot, I guess if Golden Girls is on at the same time, like there's a ton of references yes. to sex in the Golden Girls. Yes. And Married with Children had nothing but sex jokes in it. And I remember a very memorable joke from Married with Children. There were, Al Bundy was just like, sit, to me, this is one of the funniest jokes at the time. And I got it as a child too, which I thought was still holds up 
Al Bundy was sitting down. He was sort of, um, he goes, why, Peg, I just wish all the pregnant women in this world would go to one state that nobody cares about, like uh, Idaho. And then they could call it uh, Pregnaho. <laughs> I remember thinking that was such a funny joke. But it's so like body and like Jesus, man. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think there was a, a lot of stuff like that. It was a lot of body humor at that point because it was, uh, you know, it was the '80s, man. Having fun. Uh, yeah, I took a bunch of notes. Uh, what did you think rewatching the, fir the first episode? You know, I actually so I rewatched it uh, probably a week ago uh -huh. to prepare for this because I was trying to remember <laughs> like what is it that goes on in it, yeah. and because I don't remember every single episode. Sure. Uh, I think that it gives a, you know, there are certain parts of it that I'm like, as, because I know more about it, like there are certain things that come up, like Becky getting mad about her backpack. Yeah. Like, like she is very much that girl that is like, really cares what other people think about her. That's like, kind of, that's like pretty for the time. That's very much about fashion. And then Darlene being the polar opposite. She's like a cowboy wearing a Cubs hat. Yeah. Cutting her finger with scissors. Yeah. And so. Barking like a dog. So you think they establish who everyone is from Jump Street. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think that who you meet in the beginning is pretty much who people yeah. stay. Yeah. Which is a lot like life. Like we, like <laughs> we, you know, we pretty much stay exactly who we are. Like yeah. if you listen closely, everyone is gonna tell you exactly who they are from the moment you meet them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's, that's very spot on, my friend. Um, I you might ignore a lot of it because you don't want to hear it. Yeah, but... I, I didn't hear a word you said. Uh, <laughs> um, something I, I noted that um, a lot of scenes Roseanne is smiling through them which is like a usually uh, beginning acting thing but it kind of works for this actually I think it works like um, if you watch the first like five four seasons of Seinfeld Jerry kind of does that he, he still does it like at the last season but Jerry Seinfeld uh, a Sam Connick who became an actor essentially was smiling through his scenes and that's something that's just it's just a comfort level and uh, I'm, she's already like ten times better than Seinfeld was in season one. So I imagine she'll get, she'll become an actually really good actress at the end of this. It's interesting that you point that out because I wonder in watching it, like it seems genuine. Like I, I almost wonder like is she breaking character? Yeah, but it, then I, like is she actually it, amused and having fun, and the audience because it, it's filmed before a live studio audience. Uh, I mean, so they say. I believe it is. Yeah, yeah. Wait, actually, I think the first season uh, is the same audience throughout the entire thing because there's a specific laugh that you hear over and over <laughs> through the first season that you just like every time you hear. It, so, so maybe laugh. it's like can laughter the first season and then season two is filmed. I believe so. it probably became a sensation after a few episodes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it picked so that, up pretty quickly. So that makes sense. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote down they're making each other laugh actually. Well, and I, but I'm also wondering, like, if she wasn't laughing, would you have just thought she was a bitch? Like, would you have just thought you that she was, like, a mean mother who didn't care about her kids? But because she's kind of laughing as she says it, <laughs> you know that she doesn't really feel that way. So, I, so you're saying, like, if this was shot like a, like a single cam, the office sort of thing with no laugh track, would it just come off as her being, like, the meanest person alive? <laughs> Maybe. Ah, wear loafers, you fucking brat. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd like to see an episode of Rose. I'm sure it's out there, like a Roseanne with no laugh with track. No laugh track. Where it's just like, just horribly mean cutting things to her children. <laughs> that would be really funny. Uh, uh, they got some observational humor here. The butter and jelly crumbs. They were complaining about, uh, you know, Dan was complaining about, oh, I don't like when people leave crumbs on the butter. It really is disgusting. And she's like, you're just throwing it back on. But if someone did that to Jelly, that's horrifying. Which is pretty funny. It, it's funny to me that they are, or odd to me, that they're that she's like, well, would you have married if not me? Yes. Because they've been married for how long here? 15 years. Yeah. Like, they have, they've had this conversation yes, yes. before. <laughs> but it's a nice way to establish the playfulness of, of their yeah. relationship, of, you know, the messing around. Um, I counted about five applause breaks, and I can't. So if this is can laughter, then there was somebody with a button going, "This deserves a, an applause break." <laughs> there was a couple things about like you know women always have to do this. This is unfair. There was an applause break. There was a bunch of applause breaks, which I thought was pretty funny. Well, I also think that with what she was talking about at that time, I don't know if people would, if it had been a live audience without canned laughter, if people would have felt comfortable laughing at that stuff. Yes at the time. Before Roseanne existed. Right. Yeah. 
Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I, 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 I'm curious because by season two, if it's a hit, people know the tone of the show. Yeah. And whereas if it was like, you know, them corralling 60 people into a room to, to applause and, and be the audience for this, I imagine that would be like, uh, I don't know if I should laugh at this. Yeah. I don't know. The jokes seem obvious to me. The jokes are very like, um, it felt like um, a stand, like I, did she write on the show? I, I assume she wrote a lot of it. There's a lot of controversy about like, is she the creator? Is she the writer? Is she the executive producer? Did yes. she like there were there were lawsuits and yes. so there's so much like background yeah. crap that goes into it. Success uh, has a lot of fathers. Is, is, is like a quote like that, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I imagine she claimed a lot of things, <laughs> but uh, it does seem like it's punched up a lot. Like uh, like a stand up would punch and add tags at, at the end of jokes. You know what I mean? Like uh, take my wife, please. No, seriously, take her. She's here. Take her. Uh, you, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's a lot of jokes of, like, there's a joke, and then there's, like, a, a joke directly after it. Yep. So there was a lot of punch-ups from, it seemed like a, like a, a bunch of stand-up comics. I know she did hire stand-up comics for her writing staff for a season or so, and then get rid of them. Like, I know Norm MacDonald wrote on it at one point, and some other people, and that's why you'll see Norm MacDonald still defend her after all this time. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, I thought that was pretty interesting. It, uh, it felt like a play at times. In terms there of, were moments right? yeah, where it felt like a play where I I think of there's a scene where Dan is sitting at the kitchen table uh, and just the way that he's seated and the camera angle it very much felt like a like play. an actual play yeah interesting yeah I, I really liked it I thought it was uh, uh, swell and I have not made a terrible mistake good um, do you want to talk about some things that were going on in 1988 the year it came out yeah absolutely because I'm, I'm really curious about the context of it um, in 1988, uh, I was five, five years old. How old were you? Four. Look at that. Yeah. Exciting. Uh, we had some dead people. We, <laughs> a bunch of people died. Wait, people died in 1988? People died. Um, let's see. Nobody important. Nobody important. Andy Gibb. You know who Andy Gibb is? I have no idea who Andy He's Gibb is. He's from the Bee Gees. Okay, I know the Bee Gees. Yeah. He died very young. It was very sad. I, I still think about it to this day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty much no one of note. I, I, I take back uh, important people dying. It's a uh, completely big whiff on my end. Was it pretty common, do you think, in 1988 for um, women to be out and working? Yes. Like, she, has a, like, she has a job, but he doesn't. At least he doesn't have a steady job, it doesn't seem. Um, based off everything I've seen from TV and what I know, uh, <laughs> people, women were working, but a lot of times it was not in a position of command or anything. Like, even if you look at shows like, you know, like Mad Men, it was like a big deal for people to get, like, a woman to be copyright. You know what I mean? So they were doing, mm -hmm. like, secretarial mm -hmm. jobs, like, sort of helpful jobs, not actual jobs of decision or consequence. Um, 70s, I think that you had the, the full 60s to sort of get there. I, yeah, so I think people working wasn't a big deal, but maybe working in like blue collar, I think that was probably more mutual. Like women working in the 80s wasn't that big of a deal, I think, at that point. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Like the movie 9 to 5 has been out for like 15 years at this point. Yeah. Okay, okay, so fair. So I'm just ignorant. Fine, totally <laughs> fine. I mean, my mom wasn't working until after the divorce. After the divorce. But yeah, she had to work, you know? <laughs> Who's going to pay the bills? Right. Um, yeah, uh, there was a Columbia airliner jet Avianca flight crashed into the mountains in March 17th. No, does no, that, no. that do anything for you? No. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kuwait Airlines flight 422 is hijacked. Does that do anything for you? No, but I feel like, uh, I feel like a plane being hijacked is. Today would be deal. a big deal. I think it happened a lot more and people would usually hijack, demand things and then just take the plane around somewhere, get it refueled and then let everyone go. There were very few weird. They would, I, I mean, so now we think of hijacking as I'm gonna crash this fucking plane into something. Yeah. Uh, but back then people would just like demand to go to Cuba, demand prisoners released from. They sound like air pirates. That's really what they were. They were like demanding things. So like the one that happened with Kuwait Air, the Kuwait Airways flight uh, 422, they demanded the release of seven Shiite Muslim prisoners held by Kuwait. And it, it created a 16-day siege across three continents. Two, two passengers were killed before the siege ended. 
but still better than 250 passengers or something. <laughs> yeah. So that was more common the way uh, they were done. Huh. Yeah, what else? Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Do you remember anything about the 80s at all? No, I, re I remember Cindy Lauper. You remember Cindy Lauper? I mean, That's I don't remember her from the <laughs> 80s, but I know that she was around in the yeah, 80s. Yeah. I remember Cindy Lauper. I think, uh, I mean, I think that album that came out, She's So Unusual, was like 84, 85. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, so one of our birth years. Um, I do remember, I remember this because we were the same age. I remember when AIDS came out, when AIDS came out, <laughs> when AIDS was hot, um, <laughs> when it was first released to the public by the U.S. government uh, <laughs> to control uh, the minorities. That's what Kanye said, right? Um, I'm going to attach anything controversial to Kanye West. Absolutely. Anything that I say, that. I will just attach that. it to Kanye West. Uh, no, but I remember when HIV was a thing, um, I remember Ryan White got it in like the late 80s. Yeah, blood child, transfusion. Yeah, do a blood transfusion. I remember being like very sad by that because I was very close to his age and I thought I was just as cute as him. Um, that could have happened to you in the Bronx. Yeah, yeah, all those blood transfusions I was getting. <laughs> um, there was something called the syringe tide in New York area where a bunch of syringes and medical waste was washing up in Coney Island and Monmouth, New Jersey. Weird. That, forced, that forced the closure of numerous beaches. Weird. Yeah, okay. it was a big deal. Um, there was a humongous riot. I, I read all about this because I was fascinated by these. There was, you, there was a humongous, humongous riot, August 6th through the 7th. Tompkins Square Park, the mayor uh, demanded that all the homeless people in Tompkins Square Park get out. So he sent, uh, so the police commissioner sent the police to get rid of them and you won't believe it, but it turned into a riot. <laughs> <laughs> And it was artists, residents, and homeless people fighting with the police that took place over two days. So that is basically exactly what um, with Occupation Wall Street. Yes, it was exactly Occupy Wall Street. It was Occupy Wall Street. They didn't. I mean, they just wanted to exist. There was no actual political agenda attached to it, but they just wanted to not be physically kicked out of Tompkins Square Park, which is still today like a little bit of like it's beautiful, but there's also like a lot of people I see on heroin in that park all the time. I don't think I've ever been. It's right by our friend's house, our mutual friend's house. Oh. Yeah. Did we even mention that we live in New York City? No. I don't even know how that came no. up. Uh, I currently live in Brooklyn, in Park Slope. Thomas? Well, I technically live in Pennsylvania for the <laughs> year to finish my PhD. Rural but I'll be coming back to New York. Yes, you live in rural Pennsylvania. Yes, you visited. I visited several times. I, we went to a uh, Fright Fest type of event. Which was awesome. It was very good. And uh, yeah, that's where we live. Yeah, so the 80s, uh, it, I believe the Cold War was still going on. They decided to tear down a bunch of things. I think we were a year away from the wall, the wall being torn down. Yeah, it was a bunch of fun stuff in the 80s. So that's some political context for what was going on. <laughs> the first world, the AIDS day, that's a fun time, right? December 1st every year, no, anyone? It is December 1st every year when I was um, teaching human sexuality. Um, I would actually always teach about it towards the end of the semester because of that. Oh, because it always falls around. So. Yeah, I would always try to like pick the topics and stuff that kind of had to do with what's going on with events. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh yeah, one more thing. Uh, Pan Am Flight 103 is blown up over at Lockerbie, Scotland, killing 270 people. People who are held responsible is believed to be the Libyans. That was a big deal that happened. I vaguely recall this. That, like, one of my biggest fears is being on a plane as it's, like, going to crash. I guess if it was just going to blow up, like, maybe you, you wouldn't would know it was going to happen and then it would just happen, but if it were to be, like, hijacked or, like, the masks yeah. come down, like, ugh. Do you know, I, in my, in my past life, I used to be a flight attendant. I did not know that. Yes, I was. I was a flight attendant for a very small airline for uh, exactly a year. We, I went to 22 countries in one year, and I can tell you a lot about stuff. Um, for example... TWA Flight 800, which was leaving JFK Airport on its way to France, it exploded maybe about five minutes after takeoff. And the explosion, people thought it was a bomb, people thought it was a missile. No, it was an internal explosion within the plane. And the way it exploded was everything came apart, people fell from the sky fully alive, and the way they died was impact upon the water. Blunt force trauma. That's how they died. So they were. If people were like conscious at that point, because they may have just passed out from the altitude, because they were going from like 
8,000 feet altitude inside the cabin to whatever, 12,000 feet or something or 14,000 feet, they may have just passed out. But if they were fully conscious, they died from hitting the water and they had 50 seconds to think about it before they hit the water. That is terrifying. Uh, however, <laughs> uh, wait, so you said in your in a past life, you mean before you were working at the court or is this actually like some past life regression? In 1940, I was a <laughs> woman named <laughs> Belinda Banez, and I was a flight, no, no, in, in an actual life, in my okay. life. See, I really thought that you were going back to being <laughs> like, in a past life, I listened, I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know if I'm supposed to be taking him serious or not right now. Yeah, this is where you discover I have multiple past yeah, lives. Like, okay, so time for a check-in. <laughs> and in each one of them, I worked in the service industry. <laughs> oh, Even in my wildest <laughs> lives, I still had to be like a, a waiter or like a bartender of the sky yeah. or something. <laughs> well, Roseanne is going to have a lot of different jobs coming up. Uh, yeah, where she's in the service industry. You're going to see a lot of service industry stuff, which is something I did for a long time. What were some jobs you had? Like, what were some? Uh... Eh, we'll, we'll get into it later. Okay. Let's let's leave it here for now. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, so one way that I end every one of my therapy sessions with yes. my clients is I ask them what is something that they are going to remember from the session that yeah. day. So I'm. I think that's a great way to end every episode sure. of this. Like, what is something that you think you will remember from either this discussion or the mm -hmm. episode that we watched or? Yeah. Um, I will remember that um, you are a person who loves to impose things. And through each episode we watch together, you will be to my right, eagerly waiting my laughter. And I look forward to that. But you know what? There were. Did you notice there were moments where I looked over to see if you were laughing? <laughs> yes, I did. I there did were moments that. where I was like, "Did he like the joke? Did, <laughs> did he, he like get it? it? Yeah. Oh, he got it. Good. <laughs> that is one thousand yes. percent something that I do. Mm -hmm. I I'll, do the same thing. It's, I'll put it's a song fun. on and be like, mm, "I wonder if they're having the same emotional experience as I am right now." <laughs> and Thomas, is there something that you would like to remember from this experience? Yes. Uh, I, I noticed in watching this that you actually paid attention to some of the details that I didn't pay attention to. And I think that that is, I think that that's a really cool thing to notice because when we are obsessed with things or we really like things, it's because we're taking certain things out of them. So it's very interesting to hear the details that you picked out yeah. that I maybe didn't pick out or notice so much. Did you notice the bumper sticker on the fridge that said, for this I shave my legs? No. There's a bumper sticker on the fridge that says, for this I shave my legs for. I love that. I love that you noticed that because that is absolutely something that I did not. I, I always like little prop things like that. Like, uh, it, you know, like in The Simpsons, whenever there's like a newspaper thing in the background, no. it's always a joke. Nope. You've never watched The Simpsons? I'm not into The Simpsons. Season three of this show. <laughs> 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 the uh, 29 seasons of The Simpsons. <laughs> and then we'll kill each other at that point. Oh my God. So much. Uh, yeah, yeah, but in that show, whenever there's like a, a movie billboard or like a movie marquee, it'll always be a joke. And so I'm always curious of things in the background. If, if this is like a good production design, is there jokes or things that relate to the type of people these are? And that's a funny joke that would be on like yeah. Roseanne's fridge. Yeah, so um, we'll, well, and the things that are on the fridge actually end up being artwork that fans send in. Oh. And they changed it out. I don't know if it was every season or every episode, but yeah, they yeah, changed yeah. the artwork out to be artwork that fans oh, send in. Oh, that's really in. nice. Um, one thing I forgot to tell you, that so the name of this episode was Life and Stuff, which was the original title of the TV show. And then they changed it to Roseanne. Which I think Roseanne is better than Life and Stuff. I don't know. I, I, I like Roseanne because that was like the era of like Seinfeld, Cosby show. Like you sort of hit yeah. the person, the star of the show. Everything. But it is kind of an ensemble. It is like her and Dan or her and John Goodman are the stars. It is pretty much an ensemble. And I'm sure um, Laurie Metcalf will get like a big arc on this. And I'm sure lots of other people get a big they arc. All yeah. They all do. Yeah. They so all that, have something. So yeah, I think it would work. I think if we never knew the existence of, the, of Roseanne, I think it still would work. But I'm sure Roseanne was like, you should call 
<laughs> totally. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, Tommy, um, before we get going, is there some place people, is there anything else you want to cover? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So everybody, you can find us on Instagram. Yes. Uh, we do have an Instagram account for the podcast. No, no. It is a lunchbox lessons pod. Uh, you can also email us at lunchbox lessons pod at gmail.com. Send us your thoughts about like, so specifically episodes that are coming up because we're going to be watching this in order. So with every episode, we're not going to take a break to watch it. We will have watch the episode yes. beforehand but send us your thoughts your comments little facts that you know about it so right now you know keep it within the next like five or six episodes because yes. if you send us something about you know season seven right now <laughs> like i'm not i'm not gonna fucking read that forever it. um but yeah so send us like your feedback on the show little things that you know about it uh little tips that's lunchbox lessons pod at gmail.com Follow us on Instagram at Lunchbox Lessons Pod, and then you can follow me on Instagram at Thomas Whitfield eight four. You can follow me on Instagram at the Fart Box, and on Twitter at, at Justin Perez. My name. Um, I don't know what the Lunchbox. What is it called? Lunchbox Lessons. I don't know what it means just yet because we're not up to that apparently. But I cannot wait to fully understand the name of our podcast. <laughs> yeah, don't put any of that shit in the emails because if he reads them and then finds out stuff yeah, he's not yeah. supposed to. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, I'll hunt you down. I, if you give us facts or if, if there's something that you would like to hear or see in upcoming episodes, we're certainly open to that. Please hit us up. And thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. <laughs> I've learned a lot of lessons. I think maybe you'll learn some too. It's more like an obsession and I'm gonna force it on you. Intro music by Roseanne Fino. You can follow her on Instagram at Roseanne Fino or check out her website, RoseanneFino.com. That's Roseanne without the E.